First, we must start with the Song of Summoning. That's awful. I don't know how to play it. So that is a song summoning for not just Epona, but also for the next 3DS Max tutorial. It is not going to be in 3DS Max at all. This is the composite tutorial. For this one, I'm going to be using After Effects, which is the most common compositing software you guys have. However, any compositing software, the same stuff can be duplicated because all compositing software have very similar things. I'm classifying as 3DS Max still because I'm not really getting into anything complicated with an After Effects. It's really, it's just, it's just how to take those elements that we rendered out a few episodes ago and how to use them in After Effects properly. So first thing we're gonna do is we open up After Effects. We're gonna bring in our VDEXR, the Shadow PNG, as well as the street background. Oh, that's the one. Quick little lesson on some more complicated stuff in After Effects, so, or in uh, compositing in general. So in order to get things to composite right, going from 3ds Max into After Effects, and really just in order to composite correctly in general, we have to be working in a linear workspace. Um, I'm gonna give you a demonstration as to why we do linearized workspace. New composition, and then in there, I'm gonna make, make a new solid, make a green solid, and I'm gonna make a solid red solid. Right there, boom, okay. I'm gonna make a mask right down the middle of it, and I'm gonna go to feathering, and I'm gonna make this feathering, and I'll do like, what, 500 or some of that big feather. All right, so this is inherently wrong, the way this handles it. Basically, I'm, what I'm trying to do is make a, make a smooth gradation from green to red, and for some unknown reason, well, we do know the reason, it's getting, it's getting dark in the middle. So as it's blending, it's getting darker. And that's because we've got our two, our two curves and as they're being multiplied together, as they're being added together, it is, it is dipping down in luminance values rather than staying in a constant luminance value and just shifting color. This is solved by, go to project settings, go to 32 bits, working space, sRGB, and linearize working space, hit okay. And now look at the difference right there. So this is a proper blend. You can see now it's, it's going at a smooth curve. So it's no longer dipping in luminance, it's just changing in color. So if you're trying to composite anything that has, that has any sort of transparency and you're doing it in the wrong color space, you'll actually get darkening. And you see this all the time. You see it all over the sci-fi channel. You see it in a lot of movies actually where the compositing mode is wrong. Therefore, when they're trying to do like motion blur or whatever, because you get the blurriness of it, it's actually got like this little dark like fringe around everything. And now, the proper tutorial. So, we're pulling in our street background, and we're gonna pull in our beauty EXR, as well as our shadow EXR. You're gonna scale them to fit the comp. You don't have to render in 1080p every time. You can render in 720p, and then just scale it up 150%. Make sure you get it scaled so it fits the, the boundaries of your, of your composition. The first thing I'm gonna deal with is the beauty pass. Now, I can see right here, because this ball is 100% reflective, I know that this has to be about the same, the same luminance. And you can see that the sky is, um, is also too bright in my ball. So I need to bring the exposure down overall. See so up in the upper right corner here, you're probably set to RGB by default. What I like to do is change that over to HSB. And what that stands for is hue, saturation, and brightness. Brightness, we can look at our sky, right now is at about 90%. And then brightness over here, uh, we're at like 90, 95, 98%, so it's too bright. And same thing over here, we're sitting at around sitting around uh, what, 30, 27%, somewhere in there. And then on the ball, we're sitting at like 40%. We're gonna apply levels to the beauty pass. We're gonna pull our gamma down a little bit, just darkening the whole thing. So what that's doing is it's gonna pull down, it's gonna kind of leave the whites, but it's gonna pull basically the midpoint down. See now this is matching a little better. We have, we have 28% and over here we have like 30%. Our whites are a little hot. And so we're gonna bring down our output white. So that's 94. That's 90, I'll bring it down a little bit more. You just have to play with all these values and kind of figure out where it needs to be. And let's see our blacks. It's looking like we're getting a little dark in there, so we're gonna pull those up just a touch too. So, okay, so now we have our, our, our blacks, our blacks balance there, our whites, let's meter it. And you always wanna meter wherever you can and eyeball the rest, basically. Third thing, saturation. So what I like to do for saturation is I like to, to blow up my scene and I like to look for what's like what's most likely the most saturated thing you could get. Like in this case, um, tail lights are a very good example like this because tail lights, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty much a pure red object there. Um, stop signs are always good. Anything that's like a very, very saturated thing. We look at it and our saturation, we're sitting at like, uh, like 78%, let's see over here, 70%. So that, that's like a theoretical limit. You figure your camera is only gonna capture so much saturation. You'll, you'll almost never be able to capture 100% saturation with your camera. 
And what 3ds Max, when it's rendering it out, it's, it's, it's using the full range of it. So we need to bring our saturation down to get it in range of what our camera would actually be able to expose. There's no way that your bright red reflective object can be more red in your scene, can be more saturated than a bright red stop sign that was actually there. So the next thing I'm going to do is apply hue and saturation onto this. Look how saturated this stuff is right now. We're just going to dial this down. And suddenly, now it looks very pale, but it, but it, matches, it matches the scene as a key. So now if we look at the saturation, now we're sitting at like, yeah, like right about 70, which is right where our tail lights were. So our saturation matches. So you can see the difference already. This is why I didn't harp on You don't have to get things perfect in 3DS Max. You don't have to get everything absolutely perfect because you end up going through it as long as the data's there and the light's from the right direction and the quality of the light's right. Um, in, in After Effects, you go play with it. I find it's good to get close because it saves you a lot of compositing effort, but you don't have to tweak it to perfection. So if I turn it off, you can see beforehand, oversaturated, too bright, and then when we turn it back on again, boom, it all blends in very nicely. Third thing, mine's kind of low res, so I don't have to do very much, but uh, blur. Basically, if you're rendering out at 720p, you're gonna put a little blur on there. What you wanna look is, you wanna look at the sharpness of your background, and then look at the sharpness of the things that you rendered out. If you rendered out at 720p, a fast blur of like one. If you rendered out in 1080p, a fast blur of like two or three. Um, you want to put on there and that'll help uh, blend that in as well. But mine, I'm not going to because mine's super low res. So that is the beauty pass blended in. Uh, you can see if you're doing it right, it should pretty much like the mirror ball should pretty much disappear with that background blend right in there. Um, the, uh, the, you can see the dark, the dark gray ball is now much darker on the back of it. Um, everything is blending in nicely. Now, second step is the shadows. In order to work correctly, we want to right click it in the uh, project, interpret footage, main and we're going to pre-multiply that with black. Originally we rendered it on full black and we had but we had an alpha channel that was cutting it out. Now we're pre-multiplying it with black so now we're basically just getting the alpha area of that. We're actually going to do two layers of this and you'll see it's a very subtle subtle difference but you're going to see why we do it. Um, so we're going to duplicate that. Okay so the first one is set to pre-multiply and then the second one you set to add. So the adding one that's that's the light that's bouncing off. So basically if you think of the sun is hitting this yellow object and the, and the sphere there, it's bouncing light off that. So you see very subtly right down in there, I'm gonna to toggle it on and off for you guys, you can see the lights bouncing off. The quality of that light is correct, except for it needs to be, it's, it's too saturated. So we're gonna pull that saturation down a little bit, eh, about like 40 there. Okay, so you can see that. So now it's just the light that's bouncing off of that, the sunlight. Okay, and now for the shadow. So shadows can be a tricky beast. You'll almost always have real shadows in your scene. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna match to this. We're gonna look at our shadow under this car and we see that we have a brightness of, it's sitting at uh, like 3%, 2% saturation there. And then we look at ours right here and they're sitting at, uh, they're sitting at you know, a little bit higher, brightness of four or five. You wanna get as perfect as possible and that's what's gonna actually make it really sink into the scene and look real. Put levels on the shadow. Just the alpha channel is pretty much driving it around. And this is where we will pull. So you see we have we have we have a number of controls here over the shadows then for the darkness of it. We're gonna pull down the gamma a little bit, get it a little bit darker, get it zoned in there. So basically we wanna match our shadows from the, the you figure the car is a similar object to this box kind of it's just kind of sitting there. We have the shadow of the car, there we go, three percent and three percent, boom. That's the basics right there of matching these in. I want, you guys to, I want you guys to go back to your files, both overcast ones and direct sunlight ones, and I want you to go through and I want you to, to bring them into whatever compositing program you're using and mimic these techniques. Get into the right, the right color space, the right linear blending mode, and go in there and tune them in to match to your scenes as closely as possible because this little, this little last detail is what really makes things look perfect. This is how you get things so that look, they look as if they were actually shot with the camera and coming through the camera. This is the basics. There are a number of other things. You can, get, you can get incredibly complex and incredibly detailed with this. Like right now we don't have any caustics coming off these balls. Um, that's a whole nother lesson. Uh, we haven't matched the color of the shadows. Right now I'm just, I'm just making them darker. Since shadows are the devoid of sunlight, um, you're just getting the ambient skylight, which is making them actually slightly blue. Um, so you want your shadows to here to be slightly blue. So you can kind of you can kind of tweak and mess with this quite pretty much to no end, and it'll keep looking better and better. But you get diminishing returns as you go. This is what I'd consider to be pretty much set up for a final render. Pretty much, you guys are. If you can do everything up to this point, if you can render, and obviously without balls, you can stick anything into these scenes now. You can render them out, you can composite them in, and you can match them and make them look just about right. The big thing to take away from this week's lesson, we need to learn how to look at our visual cues, the visual hints that we get from our image, and match our, match our rendered elements to that. If this object was really there when I was filming it with my camera, 
how would it look? And so basically, because you're always running through a filter, your camera's, your camera's just a sensor, it's got you know, the lights coming into it, and it takes that data and it put, makes an image out of it. And the way that it makes that image is not the same way that 3ds Max makes that image. And so we're trying to approximate in your compositing program to match your camera. Um, we always match it to the camera, and then we do color correction later. So 3D matches to the camera. I'm going to set up a final exam for you guys, give you guys something to run through, um, and then season two is where we're going to get into more fun stuff. One thing to note, people keep, people keep tweeting at me. They're like, when are we going to do video? When are we going to do video? For any type of camera shot where it's just rotational movement, like if it's on a tripod, or if it's just handheld mostly in one spot, um, rather than a shot where you're actually like, translating through space and moving, this is the same technique that I would use for doing video. And basically what you're doing is you find a frame out of that video where it pretty much shows the entire CG element. You line up your shot, do your lighting in that scene there, and you can even animate it and make it move, and you render the whole thing out. And then in compositing, after you're done rendering it out as if it was still, you do like a little 2D tracker on there, you track the motion of the camera, and then you place it in there. When I don't want to do heavy 3D motion tracking in order to do it, I'll do shots where it's like where I'm moving with the camera, and then I come to a stop, and then pan over and see the CG element, and then pan back off, and then start moving again. So it looks like it's a moving shot, but technically the 3D element is only in there when the camera is still. You can basically take a short video shot where you're doing something handheld, and then take one frame out, render something, and then uh, put it into there, and then track it back in compositing. It's much easier, because especially if the element's still, you, then you don't have to render out 35 frames of it or whatever. You can just render out one frame and track it in for the whole thing. So you guys have plenty to, plenty to do. Um, I want you guys to go through, composite, get me some perfect renders. A lot of you guys have been sending me really good stuff. I try to respond to as many of them as I possibly can, give you guys tweaks. I'm actually getting, I'm actually learning a ton from doing this. At this point, if you tweet me something that's going wrong, I probably have already talked to somebody else that's said the same thing. So keep it coming, um, get these perfect, and then only when the majority of you guys can do this perfectly, we'll move on to the fun stuff.